Why is our universe the precise way it is rather than any other way we could have imagined? There are only three things that make it so. The laws of nature themselves, the fundamental constants governing reality and the initial conditions that our universe was born with. If our universe had different laws of nature, then all bets would be off. The cosmos would have been vastly different in almost any way you can fathom. Protons might decay, fundamental quantities like particle masses might not be constant, and the strengths of any fundamental forces might joltingly change at any moment. If only the initial conditions of our universe were different, the way the cosmic story unfolded would be the same in terms of broad strokes, but the details would differ between that hypothetical universe and our own. But for the fundamental constants, some changes would be profound, while others would be barely noticeable. In our own universe, the constants have the explicit values they do, and that specific combination yields the life-friendly cosmos we inhabit. One of those fundamental constants is known as the fine structure constant, and its approximate value, 1 by 137, appears in calculations that matter for a whole host of phenomena on subatomic and cosmic levels, both. Our story begins with the simple building blocks of matter that make up the universe, the fundamental particles of the standard model. Our universe, if we break it down into its smallest constituent parts, is made up of the particles of the standard model. Quarks and gluons, two types of these particles, bind together to form bound states like the proton and neutron, which themselves bind together into atomic nuclei. Electrons, another type of fundamental particle, are the lightest of the charged leptons. When electrons and atomic nuclei bind together, they form atoms, the building blocks of the normal matter that makes up everything in our day-to-day -day experience. Before humans even recognized how atoms were structured, we had determined many of their properties. In the 19th century, we discovered that the electric charge of the nucleus determined an atom's chemical properties and found out that every atom had its own unique spectrum of lines that it could emit and absorb. Experimentally, the evidence for a discrete quantum universe was known long before theorists put it all together. In 1912, Niels Bohr proposed his now famous model of the atom where the electrons orbited around the atomic nucleus like planets orbited the Sun. The big difference between Bohr's model and our solar system, though, was that there were only certain particular states that were allowed for the atom, whereas planets could orbit with any combination of speed and radius that led to a stable orbit. Bohr recognized that the electron and nucleus were both very small, had opposite charges, and knew that the nucleus had practically all of the mass. His groundbreaking contribution was understanding that electrons can only occupy certain energy levels, which he termed atomic orbitals. The electron can orbit the nucleus only with particular properties, leading to the absorption and emission lines characteristic to each individual atom. This model, as brilliant and clever as it is, immediately failed to reproduce the decades-old experimental results from the 19th century. All the way back in 1887, Michelson and Morley had determined the atomic emission and absorption properties of hydrogen, and they didn't quite match the predictions of the Bohr atom. The same scientists who determined that there was no difference in the speed of light, whether it moved with, against, or perpendicular to the motion of the Earth, had also measured the spectral lines of hydrogen more precisely than anyone ever before. While the Bohr model came close, Michelson and Morley's results demonstrated small shifts. In particular, there were some energy levels that appeared to split into two, whereas Bohr's model only predicted one. Those additional energy levels, which were very close to one another and also close to Bohr's predictions, were the first evidence of what we now call the fine structure of atoms. Bohr's model, which simplistically modeled electrons as charged, spinless particles orbiting the nucleus at speeds much lower than the speed of light successfully explained the coarse structure of atoms but not this additional fine structure that would require another advance which came in 1916 when physicist Arnold Sommerfeld had a realization if you modeled a hydrogen atom as Bohr did but took the ratio of a ground state electrons velocity and compared it to the speed of light you get a very specific value which Sommerfeld called alpha the fine structure constant this constant once you folded into Bohr's equations properly was able to precisely account for the energy difference between the coarse and fine structure predictions 
Unlike these other constants which have units associated with them, alpha is a truly dimensionless constant which means it is simply a pure number with no units associated with it at all. While the speed of light might be different if you measure it in meters per second, feet per year, miles per hour or any other unit, alpha always has the same value. For this reason, it's considered to be one of the fundamental constants that describes our universe. An atom's energy levels cannot be accounted for properly without including these fine structure effects, a fact which resurfaced a decade after Bohr when the Schrodinger equation came onto the scene. Just as the Bohr model failed to reproduce the hydrogen atom's energy levels properly, so did the Schrodinger equation. It was quickly discovered that there were three reasons for this. The Schrodinger equation is fundamentally non-relativistic, but electrons and other quantum particles can move close to the speed of light, and that effect must be included. Electrons don't simply orbit atoms, but they also have an intrinsic angular momentum inherent to them. Electrons also exhibit an inherent set of quantum fluctuations to their motion, known as Zitterbewegung. This also contributes to the fine structure of atoms, when you include all of these effects, you can successfully reproduce both the gross and fine structure of matter. Even including all of these effects, though, doesn't get you everything about atoms. Not only is there the core structure from electrons orbiting a nucleus and fine structure from relativistic effects, the electron spin and the electron's quantum fluctuations, but there's hyperfine structure, the interaction of the electron with the nuclear spin. The spin-flip transition of the hydrogen atom, for example, is the narrowest spectral line known in physics, and it's due to this hyperfine effect that goes beyond even fine structure. But the fine structure constant, alpha, is of tremendous interest to physics. Some have investigated whether it might not be perfectly constant. Various measurements have indicated at various points in our scientific history that alpha might either vary with time or from location to location in the universe. Measurements of the spectral lines of hydrogen and deuterium in some cases have indicated that perhaps alpha changes by 0.01% through space or time. These initial results, however, have failed to hold up to independent verification and are treated as dubious by the greater physics community. If we did ever robustly observe such variation, it would teach us that something that we observe to be unchanging in the universe, like the electron charge, Planck's constant or the speed of light, might actually not be a constant through space or time. A different type of variation, though, has actually been reproduced. Alpha changes as a function of the energy conditions under which you perform your experiments. Let's think about why this must be so by imagining a different way of looking at the fine structure of the universe. Take two electrons and hold them a specific distance apart from one another. The fine structure, constant alpha, can be thought of as the ratio between the energy needed to overcome the electrostatic repulsion driving these electrons apart and the energy of a single photon whose wavelength is 2pi multiplied by the separation between those electrons. In a quantum universe, though, there are always particle-antiparticle pairs or quantum fluctuations that populate even completely empty space. At higher energies, this changes the strength of the electrostatic repulsion between two electrons. The reason why is actually straightforward. The lightest charged particles in the standard model are electrons and positrons. And at low energies, the virtual contributions from electron-positron pairs are the only quantum effects that matter in terms of the strength of the electrostatic force. But at higher energies, it not only becomes easier to make electron-positron pairs giving you a larger contribution, but you start getting additional contributions from heavier particle-antiparticle combinations. At the mundane low energies we have in our universe today, alpha is approximately 1 by 137, but at the electroweak scale, where you find the heaviest particles like the BBU, ZZZ, Higgs boson and top quark, alpha is somewhat greater more like 1 by 128. Effectively, owing to these quantum contributions, it's as though the electron's charge increases in strength. The fine structure constant, alpha, also plays a major role in one of the most important experiments going on in modern physics today, the effort to measure the intrinsic magnetic moment of fundamental particles. For a point particle like the electron or muon, there are only a few things that determine its magnetic moment. The electric charge of the particle, 
which it's directly proportional to, the spin of the particle, which it's directly proportional to, the mass of the particle, which it's inversely proportional to, and a constant known as g, which is a purely quantum mechanical effect. While the first three are exquisitely known, g is only known to a little better than one part per billion. That might sound like a supremely good measurement, but we're attempting to measure it to an even greater precision for a very good reason. When we do our best to measure the universe to greater precisions at higher energies, under extraordinary pressures, at lower temperatures, etc. We often find details that are intricate, rich and puzzling. It's not the devil that's in those details though, but rather that's where the deepest secrets of reality lie. The particles in our universe aren't just points that attract, repel and bind together with one another. They interact through every subtle means that the laws of nature permit. As we reach greater precisions in our measurements, we start uncovering these subtle effects, including intricacies to the structure of matter that are easy to miss at low precisions. Fine structure is a vital part of that, but learning where even our best predictions of fine structure break down might be where the next great revolution in particle physics comes from.